From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now, at the NYSE and at ISIS exchanges and clearinghouses around the world. And now, welcome, Inside the Ice House. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. Intercontinental Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange are marvels of engineering. Engineering really of all types. The building I'm sitting in now was completed in 1904. When it opened, it had the fastest elevators in all of Manhattan. George B. Post, the building's architect, skillfully used glass and steel to create massive windows out onto Broad Street, both to illuminate the trading floor and also, in a metaphorical sense, to highlight the idea of transparency in the exchange in terms of value, something that had been opaque for centuries. Even the air conditioning system that keeps us cool in summer and warm in winter was revolutionary for its time, a system that has been constantly upgraded, especially important amid a pandemic. And beyond the bricks and mortar of the modern exchange, the imagination that goes into the engineering of our trading systems boggles the mind. At the beginning of the pandemic, for example, the systems of the NYSC group recorded a record 356 billion electronic messages, orders, quotes, and trades in a single day to help keep the global financial system afloat. Keeping things afloat is what ICE is great at. In other words, problem solving. A system is broken or doesn't work as well as it should. Well, how do you fix it, improve it, strengthen it? That's what's kept Jeff Sprecher up at night for just about a quarter of a century since he bought the struggling Continental Power Exchange in 1997 for a dollar and retooled it into ICE, a global network of transparent exchanges and clearinghouses and technology and data services business, now with a market cap of nearly $75 billion. So what keeps Jeff up at night now? (laughs) He's enjoying watching other people solve their problems, no matter how different than running a global exchange. It's the passion, creativity, and the authenticity in the work that fascinates the engineer, and frankly, anyone who loves watching people work tirelessly and with a sense of joy to achieve their dreams. A few weeks ago, after I'd said that I'd exhausted my favorite offerings on the mainstream entertainment channels, Jeff suggested I watch a few episodes of Odd Life Crafting, the ongoing YouTube journey of Eduardo Duca Casol and Roberto Becker Manchabella, a pair of young Brazilian engineers for whom there seems to be nothing they can't fix, improve, or strengthen as they craft their left-for-dead 44-foot steel sailboat into an ocean-going home. As you watch Duca and Roberta work their magic, you're mesmerized into the idea that anything is possible if you put your mind and your muscle into old-fashioned problem-solving. So today, even though we reserve this show usually for CEOs and captains of industry, we're going to be talking to captains of a different sort, bringing you across the sea and on an adventure to new lands. As Robert Louis Stevenson once wrote, "'It is better to travel hopefully than to arrive.'" And no seafaring duo travel more hopefully than Duca and Roberta. So hoist the sails and enjoy the journey with me. Our conversation with Duca and Roberta in their first ever English language podcast is coming up right after this. India has one of the strongest and fastest growing economies in the world. With a population of 1.4 billion, making energy secure, affordable and sustainable is essential in supporting its growth. In response, the Indian government aims to diversify its energy mix, increasing its natural gas consumption to 15% by 2030. Efficient to transport, liquefied natural gas is critical in supporting countries with developing infrastructure. ICE's West India Marker LNG futures contract complements our global natural gas complex, providing essential risk management as demand for liquefied natural gas in India and the Middle East grows. 
our guests today, Duca Casol and Roberta Becker Manchabella, we're just going to call them Duca and Roberta from here on in, are the content creators, explorers, and engineers behind Odd Life Crafting, a wildly addictive series on YouTube that documents their adventures. Over the course of four seasons so far, we've watched them travel the world, build a home out of a container, breathe life into an old sailboat, and set sail along the Brazilian coast, all while documenting and sharing their adventures with their now more than 240,000 subscribers across the world. Welcome, Duca and Roberta, inside the Ice House. Thanks for having us here. Thanks so much. Our pleasure. So, guys... We are just a few blocks away from the mouth of the Hudson River, named for the English explorer Henry Hudson, who in 1607 and 1608 sailed his ship the Half Moon toward Albany in search of a northwest passage to Asia. Is your ship odd ready for such a journey in the next season? Yeah, that's the main thing. We always wanted to have a boat that could take us anywhere. That doesn't mean we are going to go everywhere, but that means that we are free to dream and to reach anywhere. Our boat... Right now, I would say is not yet prepared to go to Antarctica, but has the foundation to be a boat that goes to Antarctica. And that's the most challenging thing you can do is basically press the Drake and go to Antarctica. So if we can do that, that means we can go anywhere. You've got a growing number of subscribers and followers across YouTube, Instagram and Patreon. I mentioned 240,000 in the introduction, but perhaps a quick introduction from the two of you is a good place to start. Who exactly is Roberta and Duca? I would say we are a curious couple. We are really curious to see different things and to explore. And I think having a YouTube channel and traveling the world is a really nice way to explore, but at the same time have people to help us explore. Because one thing is to buy a ticket and go to Bali. The other thing is get your sailboat, sail all the way to Bali. And when you get there, there are people that actually know you and that wants to show you the island. So the channel is a way of us meeting new people, meeting new stories and experiencing the world because I think the world is such a big place but at the same time such a small place that the internet is helping to connect them all together, all these stories together. And with the boat, we are taking our home with us into the, this journey, so it's a different way of traveling. And I didn't know it was possible until Duca start, he started reading books and sending the books for me to read. So I think it's a new way of traveling that you that people are getting to know more and more about it. So I've watched a bunch of episodes, Duca, with your power drill in your hand, installing, for example, a power inverter beneath the chart table of Odd. It brought me back 18 years to the Sir Francis Drake passage aboard a Moorings Beneteau 50 in the British Virgin Islands, desperate to fix a blown inverter so I could continue work on my laptop in the middle of nowhere. And I was completely helpless. How did you teach yourself to be an electrician? (laughs) <laughs> That's funny. You need to meet the right friends. We don't know anything about what we do. We just keep meeting people and somehow everyone helps a little bit. And for example, electricity, we met on the first week of the boat yard. We went for lunch. There's a small cafe on the, on the boat yard and we went for lunch and we met two guys that are still our friends until now. And one of them is the third generation of uh, in, uh, electrical engineers in his family. And he knows everything about that. So I'm like, I just need to become friends with him. And he cheats me. So in the beginning, he would do by himself, and then he would show me how to do it. And now we don't really need his support anymore. Of course, every now and then I give him a call and be like, hey, Fred, how do I do this? Or how do I do that? Should I do this or that? And in a way, if you do it slow, I I strongly believe in babe steps. If you take one step at a time, you can get anywhere. If you take one step at a time, you can learn about electricity, about inverters, chargers. And we also do a lot of partnerships with companies that supplies us equipment. And when we do that, it's much more than equipment, it's the consultancy. It's someone that I can call, that I can ask. And every time you call them, every time you send an email, you you learn something. And I think that's the beauty of what we do, is just we're constantly learning new skills and new things. So Roberto, from a fuse box on the hull of the odd to the latest GoPro camera that goes out, what do you think about what you've learned over these years so far about what you can actually get done with your hands and your eyes and your brain. I'm also an engineer. I'm a sanitary and environmental engineer. And I always like it to put my hands on things and to learn instead of just watching something happening. So for me, it's been 
it's hard to describe because for me, I, I never liked the, the regular job, like to go to an office and to stay in, in a place 8 to 11 or 12 o'clock and then go home. In the end of the day, you never see the daylight. You are inside some place. And for me, it's a life that I always wanted because actually I went to university without knowing what I would like to be because there was no course that I would love. And I chose the environmental side because I like the sustain sustainability and to, to live with less. So for me, the boats all together and having a YouTube channel to show this to other people and inspire other people to do the same. For me, it's, it's amazing. Like, Let's rewind the clock a bit. You both grew up in southern Brazil, spent your time in Florianopolis, one of the most dynamic cities in the world, the capital of information technology, tourism services. The city has more than 60 beaches and is the second home destination for many Paulistas, Argentines, and Europeans. Roberta, what was life growing up in a tropical paradise? And did you both sail and spend a lot of time on the water? So I met Duca, and he, he started introducing me to this world that was different for me, but I always loved to go to the beach. So for me, it was a new world that I didn't know it existed. And we this is our third sailboat. So we started smaller with a 19-foot sailboat and then a 26-foot sailboat, and now it's a 44. So we started growing this, and... I can't wait to go to warmer places and start enjoying the boat because now in our city is like a little bit cold. We are not going inside the water and enjoying the boat and the, this life. And actually, I didn't know Florianopolis was this great until I started traveling. So the first time I went in, outside the country was when we went to Australia in 2007. And I started doing comparisons and I started seeing how beautiful is our city and how much how clean is our city and and I started co doing the comparisons and now I know that our city is beautiful and I started studying a lot more about our city because we want to show the city for the viewers because we spent two months in, in our hometown so I started searching more about the town to show others about about the town it it, it was another word for me yes yeah, basically we also take things for granted sometimes. I think yeah. na it's the nature of the human being to, you live in a beautiful place, but you don't think about it. You're used to it. You've been there for 38 years. So until you go out and you see other things, sometimes you don't even realize your own backyard is really nice. I mean, I saw you leave your comfort zone in your very first episode. You are in Australia. You have this, what looks like an amazing lecture room for engineering with that video display in the middle and students in the round with all the technology that surrounds them. What is so interesting about the both of you is, you know, you come from this common love of engineering, different disciplines within engineering, but this idea of problem solving that I s talked about earlier, what drew you to the idea of engineering? You could have been into biology, you could have been into English or literature or anything else. You are problem solvers and engineers. Why? Actually, engineering is my second degree. When I was 19, I went to business school for six years. And I always thought for some years that if I would go back in time, I would do engineering instead of business. And then when I was 27, I'm like, it's not too late. Why don't I start again, over again? And then I went to engineering school. The reason why, to be honest, is a really simple reason, because I wanted to know how you can make a building stand up and not fall. I always wanted to be a structure engineer and that's why we went to Australia. I went to start a master degree in structural engineering because I'm curious about materials. I'm curious about the resistance of materials and how things stand. And in, in a way, somehow, even though we are not engineers anymore, supposedly, what we do has a lot to do with engineering. The materials of the boat and how we, we design solutions of the boat. We did a lot of modifications on the boat that our knowledge of engineering and uh, the way we can see the forces and understand the stresses of the material help a lot on what we do. Like the plumbing, the plumbing system. Not just, yeah, the plumbing, but also, for example, the sailing system, like the stays and like how we change the, the cables for the sails and we put in a different position and we need to consider the forces and everything in the end is related to engineering. 
Roberto, while you were in Australia with Duca, you took this intensive English course. And throughout your episodes, we watch you becoming increasingly proficient in English, speaking the language, even correcting his English from time to time. <laughs> Why was learning English so important and how does learning a new language shape the way you understand other cultures and also your own? When we were in Australia, I was studying just English and we started speaking English between us. The, the first idea was to say a little bit more in Australia and English was important to get the, the residence show visa. So the idea was for me to learn and to feel comfortable with the language, to find a job in the area, in, in engineering area. And I think English worldwide is the most, uh, the language that everyone speaks. So it's a way of getting to know other cultures. And, and I think our channel is in English because we want to travel and to know people. And English is, is a way of communicating. And I think it's the most important thing to learn a language that you can communicate with others no, ma no matter where you go. It's funny because sometimes if you don't know how to properly communicate, because one thing is to know how to buy a coffee in a language. The other thing is how to maintain a conversation in a language. Yeah. And I can say but for myself, I've been speaking English, I would say for the past uh, 23 years maybe. And it became something that's natural. I'm not saying I'm, I'm good at English. I, I do a lot of mistakes. There's a lot of words that I don't know, but I learned how to have the fluence. I, I learned how to change the word. If I don't know a word, I just substitute for something else and I can maintain a conversation. And I know how many good experiences that brought to me. One of the reasons why I always wanted to be a channel that is fully in English is because I wanted Hobera to have the same experience as I had already. Yeah. And for a while it was tough because when before the channel we would travel and someone would ask so what's your name and she would look to me and say can you answer my name and then oh do you have sisters and she would look to me i'm like no you need to have your own legs and it's important because you're going to have so many more experiences that it you it, it, it will understand in the future and now she do understand and this that was like a commitment in australia we spent three months literally we wouldn't speak portuguese to each other but Roberta's English is getting much, much better. And also because Roberta is the responsible for subtitles. We do subtitles in Portuguese, Spanish, and English, every video. The output of work is amazing. And when you watch, you know, from the early episodes on, you realize that, you know, how things are not always smooth sailing, as they say. Things can go, you can get in a fight. Even the best laid plans can go awry. And about six months into Duca's program in Australia, you realized that it wasn't right for you. And again, you packed up your things. But this time you had to Bali, Thailand and New Zealand for this six month long sabbatical. Why travel to those places and what did you learn along the way? Indonesia was the cheapest place we could go and we could afford to spend a long time because we were not traveling as tourists. That was like we had a go. We went on a trip that was actually four months and we had a go. It was literally four months straight, like 120 days. We have a mission of finding out what are we going to do with our lives from the next year on. And we didn't, in Indonesia, we spent two months on the same hotel room because it was cheaper to pay monthly. And we, we took less things because we left some bags in New Zealand with our friends. So we took less things to pay less baggage. La yeah, luggage. We, we had anything. Was basically, we had one goal, just one goal. It was not to travel, was not to see places, was to walk on the beach every day and talk in between us. We need to get to an agreement of what we want to do for life because we are already, right now I'm 37, Robert is 38, and time's flying. And if we need to do something, nothing happens in one year. It takes a few years to, for something to happen and we need to commit to a plan. So we were 100% open. If you back then, I don't know, get me a job in Japan, we, we might be living in Japan right now. We are 100% open to opportunities and for ideas and that's when I realized that for the past many years, I was doing what I didn't want to do in order to achieve what I really wanted to do, that is sail the world on our own boat. So I'm like, I need to find a way of us getting to our dream, using the dream itself to finance the dream. And that's when we created a five years plan to get to where we are right now. And this brings us 
to the first season of Odd Life Crafting. It was born, I think, on March 10th, 2017, if the YouTube posting is right. And compared to what you post now, really this bare bones piece of video with hand-drawn credit roll and off-the-shelf music, here's a clip from the first episode. At this point, we realized that we were studying or working seven days a week and that the dream of an Australian quality of life wasn't happening for us. At least, not at that time. Sometimes in life, we make decisions that can affect us for a long time. So, after we make our minds about something, it's always hard to go back and change the plans. Well, but sometimes that becomes necessary. This was one of those times, and luckily I was not alone. After weeks and weeks thinking and talking, we finally decided. With the huge economical and political crisis going on in Brazil, there was no point in going back to our country without a plan. So instead of that, we decided to take a few sabbatical months and travel until the end of 2016. To make it short, we took 120 days to travel to some place where we thought it would be relaxing enough or cheap enough for us to stop and take the time to reflect about our own lives and decide what we want to do from 2017 and on. And that's how we moved from Sydney to Bali. Where did this idea of documenting your lives come from? I mean, you know, this initial conversation between the two of you, it could have been in Japan, as you said, it turns out to be this life on YouTube. Actually started a lot before that, and I don't think we mentioned that on the videos yet. But in 2005, I took six months off and I went to live in Europe, and somehow I ended up in Morocco for the film festival of Marrakesh. And I met three guys from Morocco that they do documentaries together, and I'm like, I know what I want to do for life. I want to do documentaries. And that was 16 years ago. And one of the guys had, he was a professor at Columbia University in Chicago. And I was an exchange student in high school in Evanston, that's right next to Chicago. So we create a really good connection in between us. And I'm like, I want to go to Chicago to study at Columbia. I want to go to a film school. Never happened. We couldn't afford to go that back then. We end up not, I end up not going to Chicago. But the dream of making documentaries was still on my mind. And I think it was like maybe a year later or two years later, I thought if I cannot study film, I'm going to make a film. And that's when I tried to do my first documentary back in 2007. And that's when I met Robert two months earlier. And I'm like, hey, I'm going to go for a one year trip with a friend to try to do a documentary. Do you want to go with us? And that's how we, so that means that the camera and documentaries is been in between us for over 15 years now, since the day one, literally day one. So that's something really natural for us, the dream of, even before I had the dream of traveling the world on a sailboat, I had the dream of doing documentaries. That first episode that I watched, I think has about, it's only a six minute thing to start. It has about 49, 50,000 views. Now you're 200 episodes in and your viewers are between like 175,000 to 250,000 per episode so far, I see the comments come in, 60 comments, 100 comments, whatever, and you're answering so many of them. What's it like to interact with your fans? We actually, we read every single, every single comment. And for my, for my English is great because I learn with the comments and we, all, we actually learn how to do things for the boat with the comments as well. So we read every single comment and we try to answer as many as we can, but lately it's been hard because we are leaving the boat. We need to say, we need to change anchorage, we need to film and we need to edit. And it's been hard to answer all of them, but we try our best. But it's really nice because you know names that have been coming for like four years. Yeah. When you see the name, you kind of see the person, even though you don't know the person. It's really cool when you see that someone comments something that you see that they understand us that they can see what we're doing, that they can understand our dream. And it's, it's crazy because for a long time, we dream of something and no one knew about it. No one helped us about it. Some didn't believe on it. And now seeing so many comments uh, kind of shows us that we are on the right way, shows us that our dream is possible. The dream is possible, you're on the right way, and people are beginning to follow you so much because you know, no sense of self-importance here, but English is such a common language around the world. And let's take a quick listen of just one other segment of the show. But I, I know the channel, we have a big enough country to have a channel only in Brazil, but I don't think it's fun to, you know, meet only people from here. We just want to meet people from all over, from different countries. 
and there are a lot of people interested on what you're doing in so many different countries if you see the list of countries that watch the videos it's just amazing i mean we we never expect that that many people from that many countries would watch what we do there is even country that we never heard yeah, about. yeah <laughs> sometimes we, we see countries that we never heard about and that's really cool i mean you've met us here at the new york stock exchange you've earned a big fan in jeff sprecher but tell us about some of the other great friends that you've made along the way we are slowly starting going north in our coast in brazil we are on the second stop after our hometown and on the first one and we, we anchored the boat and someone sent us a message if we need a mooring because they recognize our boat yeah. and they they have been following our channel. And we said, no, we don't need a mooring because we are in, in the anchors. But do you have a washing machine, maybe a shower? We would love me to meet you. Yeah, <laughs> so, like, just want to make friends. Yeah. It's crazy because some channels, they don't, they want their privacy. So they don't want the boat to be recognized. The reason why we have an orange boat is because we don't want to lose opportunities. Sometimes we might stop in your island, the place you live, and our, the video is going to be two months later. And two months later, you're going to be, oh, you were here. I didn't know. I wanted to meet you. So if we have an orange boat, people know it's our boat. This case was exactly that. The guy, he said that he woke up and his house is on the top of the hill. And he looked to the bay and be like, that's Robert and Duca. What are they doing in my bay? So he messages and I'm like no we don't need your mirroring boat but we need to meet you that's it and we spent three days on their house basically every single day we went for lunch dinner we he became took, friends and anyway, took I'm, us to stores and we bought uh, fabric we used their sewing machine so it was a great we had a great time just for having our orange boat and you have an orange boat you're also selling merchandise now with odd life crafting on the shirt how are the merchandise sales going Duca's brother, he draws watercolors, so we went to have different t-shirts to sell on, on the on the store. So yeah. it's one of the next goals is to improve the store. It's just so many projects at the same time. The store is something that we do have, but it's something that we still need to do our homework. We need to get better at that because we have so many ideas, but the day unfortunately have 24 hours, <laughs> yeah, exactly. not 36. But that's what Robert was saying. We really want to do a line of clothes with watercolors. I think so pretty, a boat painted on watercolors, just really pretty. And I'm convincing my brother to do, to help us on that because he's a really good watercolor painter. It's something that's nice because sometimes you go to a different place and you see someone wearing something that you created. The logo of Odd Life, we created back in Indonesia and the scene that we showed on episode five, if I recall, that's the real time we came up with the name. That was exactly, uh, we, well, it's not fake. That's exactly when we created the name. And that was exactly when I drew the, with my hands, the logo. And when I see someone wearing that, it's just cool. For example, in Annapolis, we stay in another couple's boat, at a friend's boat that also has a YouTube channel. And we literally had 15 minutes to pack before we left Brazil, because this was a last minute trip. And we didn't bring enough clothes, literally, like put something on the bag and let's leave. And we went to the boat show and we're like, oh, we don't have Odd Life Craft shirt to, to wear today. And the guy looked at me and say, but we have because we bought your merchandising. So we went to the show borrowing their shirts from our project. In the second season, after moving back to Brazil, you decided to build a house out of an old shipping container. You found some land surrounded by lush greenery and chicken coops. You spoke in previous videos about being inspired by tiny houses and living this minimalist lifestyle. Why did you embrace that project of looking at a shipping container and saying this could be home? Duca's dream was always to build a boat from scratch. And he, we always liked the steel boat because it's safe. It's a heavy boat and it's stable. stable. And Duca was to, wanted to build a boat from scratch. So the idea was to have a, a tiny house made out of metal so he could learn how to weld, how to do anything because we didn't have any experience with tools. And the idea was to do something that could not sink uh, before <laughs> we do something that could sink. Yeah, basically the tiny house was an experiment, it was like our university, it was a place that we didn't need to pay for the land. So it was right. my dad's land, so we could stay for as long as we need. And we would go to work every day and feed. And we felt like, what are we going to invent today? What can we experiment? I never used any tool in my life. Roberta never used any, any tool in her life. We learned how to weld, we learned how to do woodworking, and we learned by trying and by making mistakes and just trying again and again and again. And that was a really good school 
that made a lot easier to refit a boat because, as Roberta said, a boat can sink, a house doesn't sink. So the responsibility of working on a boat is a lot bigger. I mean, I saw yeah, you well, sailing in the middle of the darkness. You know, you, you have no land anywhere nope. to see. This boat no. cannot fail when either you get your shift overnight or the early dawn wake up. You can't see anything. No, anything. But somehow you get prepared for that. You study a lot. You Six months ago, I did a course to become a captain. So now I'm a lesson captain. So I can, by Brazilian law, I can take the boat anywhere in the world. I, I have the lessons for that. And that's how I think you make it more safe. It's by studying, it's by preparing yourself for what is to come. And what's to come, I have no idea. Basically, we have an ongoing project that I have no idea where it's going to take us. But I know that we are going to keep doing until we are excited. If we stop being excited, that's the day we will quit. Yeah. I mean, what's to come is what we'll be talking about in the second half of the show. But before we get to the break, it's probably a good time to introduce this third character in Odd Life Crafting, which is actually Odd. She's 44 feet galvanized steel sailboat designed by Michel Jobert and Bernard Niefeld in France and built in the Dinaper boatyard in Brazil. Ship had been neglected and docked for about 22 years. How did you find her? And what led you to believe that this was the vessel that you wanted to spend so much time restoring and living on? That's a crazy story. Uh, I was in love with another design, actually. And there was one hull, not, was not finished, but th there was one for sale. It's a long story, but just to try to make short, I tried to buy this boat. And on the day we were going to make the offer to buy this boat, the guy gave up. He's like, no, I cannot sell my dream. So he didn't sell the boat. And for one month, I couldn't sleep. I was sad because we lost our boat. And a friend of ours said, there is a boat that my friend has a friend that has been on the drive for seven years. Back then he said seven years. It was actually 22 years abandoned. But he's like, no, there is this boat that I know a guy that, I, the guy that knows the guy that knows the guy that owns the boat. It's not for sale, but you can convince him to sell the boat. So basically we bought a boat that after we started the channel, we received so many emails like, how could you buy this boat? The owner didn't even let me see the boat. No one, you know, it's crazy because there are two completely different kind of comments. When we bought the boat, YouTube comments would be, oh, no one bought this boat because it's not worth that. There is a reason why this boat's been sitting for 22 years. I'm like, no, you kind of don't know the story. It's actually for 22 years there because the guy never wanted to sell the boat. So basically we contacted him. We explained our project. We explained that we were building a house and we explain what we want to do with the boat, and the guy decided that we were good future owners of the boat. He believed in what we were doing, and according to him, he saw himself 24, 25, 26 years ago on us. His wife and him were our age when they bought the boat. According to him, he had his best eight months of his life living on this boat, and it was like, I think you guys are the right persons to take the boat over. And we bought the boat. Like. And the good part of the boat is that it has a center board, so we can have one meter draft, and we can go inside the rivers, and we can even stop at the sand, the beach. Yeah, and the crazy thing is that this boat, during one year, I read 15, around 15 books about circumnavigations, and that's how I fell in love with the idea of traveling by boat. And then... One of my favorite boats, one of my favorite books, I gave to Roberta on our seventh anniversary. Okay. I think it was like our seventh anniversary. And I wrote behind the cover saying, one day we're going to sail the world in a boat named Odd. Back then, I had no idea we would have a YouTube channel called Odd. I, I don't know why. I didn't even remember that I wrote that. I, I, so we were buying the boat and I discovered that the boat we were buying is actually the same design as the boat from the book, built in the same place. So I'm like, I'm going to read again the book. And when I open the cover, I'm like, whoa. Was, I actually predicted that and I didn't remember that. And it was, this book was one of the reasons we would love to have a steel boat. Yeah, it's true. So yeah, the, the book sold us the idea of a, a steel boat. And then we bought the same. It's not exactly the same, but it's 99% the same. Built in the same place. And nowadays we are actually friends with the owner of the boat. Uh, the, the, uh, the former owner and the actual yeah, owner. Yeah, the actual owner, now we know him. And the former owner that wrote the book, when I saw that, I took a picture of the, 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 the what I wrote and I sent him because I needed to tell the story. And this is a guy that during the refit, any kind, anytime we have a question about the boat, we would contact him because he traveled, he did a circumnavigation on the same boat. So he knows about it. 
We will continue our circumnavigation of the life of Odd Life Crafting right after this. Our conversation with Duca and Roberta continues on Inside the Ice House. Stick around. The transition to electronic trading is gaining support in fixed income markets, presenting opportunity and driving demand for data. At ICE, we're a leading provider for fixed income data and analytics. We offer a comprehensive fixed income execution solution via ICE Bonds, committed to execution quality, transparency, and information. We provide a wide range of platforms with deep liquidity pools that support multiple trading protocols. Our fixed income indices can be tailored to your investment strategy, powered by our data. Our ESG data offers increased transparency into fixed income markets. Access the ICE fixed income ecosystem, including the ICE Bonds execution platforms, evaluated pricing and analytics via ICE fixed income select. By creating a single point of access for our execution platforms, customers can utilize a variety of trading protocols and manage risk. ICE supports your end-to-end -end fixed income workflow, increasing transparency, execution efficiency, and data access across the fixed income marketplace. Welcome back. Before the break, Duca, Roberta, and I were discussing their history, their sabbatical that led them to become adventurous content creators and how they connect with their viewers around the world. So, guys, what has been the toughest part of your journey so far? At to be honest, videos once a week? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> because some people think like, oh, to, ref to build a house or to refit a boat is really hard. That's easy. The hard thing is to have a new video every Monday, 10 a.m because we're really serious about what we do. We really want to have good content every week. And it's tough to have a new video every week because you know how it's life. Some weeks are exciting, some weeks are not that exciting, but to guarantee a new video every Monday with something that people want to watch, that's the toughest thing. Uh, during the refit, we always had something to show because we, we had something before and after. So it's easy to have a content, but now that we are we finished the refit. We never finish a refit. We abandon the refit and start sailing around and we fix things along the way right now. But now it's been hard to, to try to find a content and to try to, to show something different. So usually nowadays we go out of our comfort zone. That would be stand on the, stay on the couch watching Netflix or uh, other YouTube channels. So now we try our best to experience more things, to show different things to the audience. And it's been great, actually. Yeah, I think it's a challenge now because we are right now on a turning point. We did two years of a refit. And as Robert said, the refit, you have beginning, middle and end for every project. And now we need to relearn how to create content. We need to relearn how to tell the story because it's a different story now. But I think that's the fun of it, because if you do the same thing forever, people get tired of watching. I think it's important to reinvent yourself every couple of years or every five years or whatever. I mean, like it's, it's important to challenge you, otherwise it gets, gets boring. At what point do you start to feel that the YouTube platform is working, that you're actually getting some advertising revenue? Because I watch your episodes now, yes. I, see the, I see the ads click in and I watch a little bit of the ads. So oh, thank thank you. you're, you're <laughs> making money for somebody. And you're, how does it work for you? The first videos, we didn't make any money. Until the, the finish of the, the end of the house, we were already financing our project with AdSense and Patreon, basically. That was the, our main revenue was AdSense and Patreon. But we would not make enough money to do whatever we want. We could fin finance the house, but we need to be really careful on how we spend money. Back then, to buy a sheet of plywood was really hard. It's like, oh, just one sheet, not two. We buy one. We, you don't buy like three rolls of tape. You buy one roll of tape. It was like really more careful. We need to be careful with how much we spend because we were not making much. We would Back then, we would make like $1,000 a month. That's it. And then at what point do you attract the interest of people saying, look, Duca and Roberta, they're buying plywood or they're using hammers and nails or drills. Let's sponsors or partners who say you could do it with our equipment come in and, and create those kinds of relationships. Uh, I always have the theory that 100,000 subscribers would be a magical number. I'm not sure if it's true or not, but I, I always thought that if we reach 100,000 subscribers, 
that means we are someone, that we are actually a channel that means something. And took us two years to get to 50,000 subscribers. And then when we bought the boat, in six months, we went to 100,000 subscribers. And that's how, when people start con to try to find us and companies starting to pay attention to us. Yeah. So I think, I would say 100,000 subscribers was when things is starting to happen. And when like we could start sending emails to companies because yeah. in the beginning they would not listen to us. For example, Bosch, the company that makes like uh, drills and they never answered my email. I, I, I mean, nowadays I didn't even send anymore, but in the beginning I tried many times to contact them and we're just so small that they wouldn't listen to us. Actually, now, now things change a little actually bit. Actually the first time what happened, we reached 100,000 and a company contacted us offering a partnership uh, for cables, for lines, for the boat. It never went through. We never finished the partnership because we we have the old mass. We didn't know anything about our sales. We were not ready for that. We were not ready. But it was the start to start looking for companies. And we we, start, we started think, thinking that if this company has any interest in us, maybe other companies are willing to listen to us. So we started reaching out other companies and it was the beginning of the partnerships. Yeah, with. basically this partnership never happened, but opened our eyes that it was possible. The first time was naive way of doing. And now kind we of. kind of, the first, the first yeah, time was The last was one naive. was 100% programmed. I told my dad, dad, this week we shot a video and I said, we need this product. I give you one week and they will contact us they did in 48 hours. Because some subscribers, they see you need that, so they send an email to the company, and then the companies need to talk to us because they have no but option. But it was organic, actually. The, the idea was no. we broke our windlass. We have a manual windlass to put the, pull the anchor up, and we broke it. It, it has 30 years old, the, the metal is, is already corroded. A little over two months ago, you posted a video where you finally took Odd onto the open seas. And I can hear the episode now as you're talking about the first time that you unfurled the mainsail with the full reefing, and then the first time that you pulled the Genoa out and you're under full sail. I mean, talk to us a little bit about the marvels of our oceans and how you see them. I mean, President John F. Kennedy once said this at the 1962 America's Cup dinner. I uh, really uh, don't know why it is that uh, all of us are so committed to the sea, except I am, uh, I think it's because, in addition to the fact that the sea uh, changes and the light changes and uh, ships change, it's because uh, we all came from the sea. And it is an interesting uh, biological fact that all of us have in our veins the exact same percentage of salt in our blood that exists in the ocean. And therefore, uh, we have salt in our blood, in our sweat, in our tears. We are tied to the ocean. And when we go back to the sea, whether it is to sail or to watch it, we are going back from whence we came. Is that how you felt when you finally went out? Yeah, I think the ocean is a way of going back in time. Nowadays, we are connected to the internet 24 seven. And on that trip, we had no cell phone connection. We were maybe 50 nautical miles off the coast, no connection, just ocean water. You won't see land, you just see water. And that's crazy how time flies by in a different speed and how suddenly a lot of different things are more important than ever just how you need to be awake on your uh, shift, how you need to pay attention, how much deeper you sleep for two hours, because on this trip, Roberta never sailed a bigger boat before. And I'm like, it's the first trip, so we took a friend with us. And me and him would take shifts because we had no autopilot, so we need to be at the helm 24 seven. So it was two hours one, two hours the other, two hours one, two hours the other. And it's funny how you want to be rested for your shift because you want to be in alert because it's it's for security. And when you go to bed, you just sleep so deeply compared to when you are in land because in land you have so many things to worry about that I, I'm, I'm someone that have trouble sleeping. I always, I dream too much, I think too much. I think when I lay down in bed is when I create solutions for many of my problems. And it's funny that the only 
time I can sleep really well is when we are in a crossing because I trust the person on shift. I know he knows what he's doing. And I know that I need to be rested for my shift. So that means for two hours, sometimes feels like I had more rest in two hours than a full night of sleep when you're not at the ocean. So if it's, just, I don't know, it's just going back in time to a time that we have no internet, that we have no cell phones, and that all it matters is to keep the boat safe, to see the dolphins jumping sometimes, or to expect some winds that are going to change. And just, it's funny, you spend two days in a boat with two friends and your wife, and you become so much closer than you were before. Time in a sailboat is different. Sometimes you spend one month with one person, and it feels like you know them for 10 years, because you're... For example, right now on the boat show, we stay for a week with three couples and two dogs in a boat. And our cabin was next to another couple. And all it divides us was one thin sheet of plywood in between us and a vent right next to our head. So that means anything we whisper, they could hear. And it was basically like sleeping together with a plywood in the middle. And that's crazy. And like, we never met them before. We just met them last week. And I'm pretty sure we are friends for life because it brings people together. It's a, I don't know, it's that kind of experience that is hard to describe and that you will only know when you experience. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, one of the most powerful things about your platform and what you see from both of you, this really hard labor that you both put in to do all of the work in terms of the container in the house or the refit of Odd, is that you take your fans and your followers along on this journey, and they they learn the same things that you're learning along with you. You don't. You, you always say that you may not know the answer, and that you're both willing to try, and you're both upfront and honest about the mistakes that you've made along the way until you finally drop that anchor at the very right spot. Roberto, why do you think your story resonates so much with people who may have never even seen the ocean or been on a sailboat? We met a lot of people this week that said that our channel is about our relationship and not what we show uh, physically, like something that we did, but our personalities, how we work together and the relationship between us and our positivity. Because sometimes something goes wrong, but we keep positive, like we need to fix it. No one's going to fix this for us, so we need to fix it. So let's do it. Let's learn how to fix it. So people say that what connects them to our channel is the personality, the personality and the positivity, and not just the content itself. Like, installing batteries, maybe it's not about the installation of the batteries, but how we, we did that. The, yeah. positivity the positivity is natural. It comes through in, in every frame of the show. Yeah, basically, we always say that we are not a DIY... Channel, tutorial yeah. channel we don't want to teach anyone how to do anything because we don't know how to do it we, show we our want mistakes. to show our mistakes so you don't need to make the same mistakes so you know what i mean like because some channels they would show just like the beginning the middle and the end and it seems so easy but if you wanted to do it you could not do it so if we show the reality of how hard it was and how many mistakes we did maybe you learn a little bit at least with our mistakes and makes it easier for you to discover your own way of doing because there are so many different ways to do the same thing. There is no one right way. There is my way, your way, someone else's way. Roberta, it feels like there's a bit of a running joke through the series that one of your favorite phrases is, finally. I yeah. mean, <laughs> and, and it makes sense. I mean, after more than two years, Odd was finally on the water after what was only supposed to be a three-month project. When something forces you to tack and change course, how did the two of you go about adjusting and making sure that you're continuing to move forward? Uh, I think the communication is the most important thing we, because we don't do anything um, like I don't do anything by myself without asking Duca for his opinion. So I think the communication is the most important thing. Like, Yeah, I think actually w my dream job is not just making videos for YouTube. That's not our, my dream job. My dream job is to have a job that I love doing it but at the same time that I'm open to new opportunities. Because for a long time I was closed and I saw a lot of people having great opportunities to do things that I couldn't because I had to go back to universe or I need to go back to my job. And now we have a job that we can change the direction anytime. For example, we were not supposed to be here today. <laughs> uh, we literally decided to go to the boat show, I, I would say like 15 hours before we, we flew out of Brazil. Yeah. We bought the tickets in like seven hours from the idea. 
So that means we are really open. We want a job that if you say right now, we are supposed to fly back to Brazil tomorrow, but if something happened today, we might not go to Brazil tomorrow. And I mean it. Yeah. If someone invited us to, I don't know, fly to Alaska now because there's a sailboat there and it would be great content, I would be like, I'll call the marine and say, sorry, we're not going to go back tomorrow. We're going to go back in a month. When we find out that we were going to come to the New York Stock Exchange, we were not prepared. We had left Brazil already. We were on the way to the airport. I'm like, we cannot go. We don't have clothes to do that. And they were like, no, 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 we can find you a jacket. I'm like, so you don't need to have anything. You need to know the right people. On your most recent episode, you finally got your autopilot set up after months of trying to calibrate it with your compass. Homer once said, or wrote, the journey is the thing. And as you continue your adventures, where do you expect to sail to and where will the currents and winds take you, you think? At first, we wanted to come to the Caribbean this year, but then we realized that not many channels, international channels, exported Brazil. There is only one other channel that is in Brazil. We have a long coast. So the idea for the next year or so is to explore our backyard, is to get to know our own country and to share this with the world because there are so many little fishing villages and so uh, so many little rivers and so many places to explore that I think before we go abroad and we go explore different seas, we need to get to know our place first. And hopefully by next year, we will end up in the Caribbean. And from there, I don't know, we might go to Europe, we might go to the Pacific. Well, guys, I happened to find you because I was having a conversation with my my colleague and boss, Jeff Sprecher, and he said, you really ought to watch this. And and I found myself hooked along with your 200,000 other subscribers. But as we finish off our conversation, for folks who have not yet seen an episode of Oddlife Crafting, tell us how best they find you. How do you recommend that they dive into the world of Oddlife Crafting and where exactly do they find you? The perfect way would be to go to youtube.com forward slash Oddlife Crafting, really easy, or you just type on the search Oddlife Crafting. If you want to understand what we do properly, I would go to the first video. It's not the best audio. I like the concept of the video. I think it is not perfect. The audio is, the microphone was not that good, but that's just a way of understanding our motivation. So the first five videos, I think they are key videos to, uh, it's to properly understand our story. And then if you're really uh, patient, you can watch 220 videos, or if you're not that patient, you can skip and go to the boat straight. That's what we are doing now. But, but in the beginning, there is a mix of Portuguese and English because we didn't know what we were going to do with the channel and what we, it was the beginning. It was all uncertain. And I think also uh, we did a website. We created a website a short while ago, like uh, a two month months ago, ago, two, months, two ago. months ago. And we are trying to, to put things com compacted there so we are trying to there is the explanation of the beginning of the channel who we are and the boat yeah and we are trying to create more content for yeah. the so the website is oddlifecraft oddlifecrafting.com but uh yeah i mean like don't expect nothing professional but if you go to our youtube channel expect something real and made with passion that's it it's not professional film it is not the audio is not perfect there's a lot of wind noise but it's real. That's the main thing because we were tired of watching TV and be like watch big productions that you don't know what's real and what's not. At least if you watch our channel, you can be sure that that's us. We meet many people along the way and they'd be like, oh, so you're just like David. Yeah, of course. We, you know, we film our daily, daily life. We're just us. And that's exactly what it is. It is real, it is passionate, and sometimes you hear wind noise, but that's what makes Odd Life Crafting so special. Guys, thank you so much for joining us inside the Ice House. Thanks so much for inviting us. That was, I mean, they, they didn't even finish. We're going to spend a few hours here <laughs> on the New York Stock Exchange. We, we still have the, the market to close with the closing bell this yeah. afternoon. <laughs> that was, uh, that's been an awesome experience. We have no words to describe how much grateful we are for the opportunity to sit here in this beautiful library and just talk to you guys. I can't wait to see the next episode. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting us. And that's our conversation for this week. Our guests were Duca Casol and Roberta becker Manchabella of Odd Life Crafting. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or a question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at ice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show was produced by Stefan Capriel with production assistance from Pete Ash and Ian Wolf. I'm Josh King, your host, signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week.
Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 